Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and then we'll get there as well. You've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be looking at verses 35 to 49. All right, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 49. Let me read it and you follow along in your copy of God's word and then we'll begin together. So let me read. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life until it dies, unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen into each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If therefore a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born of the image of of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven." Let's pray, and then we'll get into God's Word together. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we again come before you uh, this morning, and and no different than any other Sunday, Lord, that we are coming uh, expecting to hear from you. And so we have our Bibles open, your Word open to us right now. And Father, we are not looking to hear from me, and I pray that you would speak through me, that, you know, the truth is I have nothing to offer, Lord, I Uh, I have nothing to say but what we see in God's word. And so, Father, we pray, would you open our hearts, open our eyes. Lord, give us the ability to hear what you are saying clearly through your word. Make it clear. Father, apply it. Counsel us, we pray. And Father, would you do the same even as I preach? And Lord, this morning, I just matter so much because of the reality of what we're looking at, of what you've told us of the resurrection. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, would you help us to understand what is true and what has been done in Christ. And the reality of what that means um, could be very different for one person to the next here. And I pray, would you speak directly to hearts and souls? And so Lord, we pray and we agree that together. We thank you again for your word. Help us to focus on it now. Lord, would we we behold your glory? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So this is Easter Sunday, and uh, again, just so glad to see so many of you uh, here this morning, and excited to open up God's Word and dive into the resurrection this morning, what this means. We've been going through, uh, try to turn everything into a series, maybe it seems, but this would be like a two-part series from Good Friday to today, and so the series is God at Work. So we looked at Good Friday, God at Work to rescue His people. Uh, True rescue is a work of God. And then this morning we're looking at this, and the title of God's or the title of this message is "God at Work: True Life." So true life is a work of God, and so we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians 15, and, and this morning reflecting on Easter. And I don't know how familiar each one of you are on Easter, but this is a time where we reflect life. We reflect life for sure, 
And as I was thinking of this, this thought is very interesting how we describe life. When we talk about life, there's many ways that we describe it. And so I uh, hear some of them, and these are, this is not exhaustive at all, but it's very interesting when we say life, and we say hey, we're going to talk about life, how often this comes up in our language, and I think how, how much we feel the weight of this thing we call life. So here's some descriptions, just uh, we hear things like, uh, life's not fair. They had a rough life. Uh, this is the life. Their life was taken from them. My life will never be the same. They had a second chance at life. How's retired life? How's the dad life? How's the mom life? How's college life? What's the meaning of life? What's the origins of life? We hear things like, what's life after death? And then there's the desire for a healthy life. The desire to live maybe a good life, to make sense out of life, to get the most out of life. Maybe you seek out or have sought out a life coach. I don't know if you've heard of those. We celebrate new life. A baby is born. It's a celebration. Look at this new life. We feel the sobering reality of life passing us by. As we get older, maybe, life just seems to speed up. And then we feel the pain of life slipping away. There's all sorts of ways that we describe life when we think about life particularly on Easter, we are in fact reflecting on life. This is what we're doing. And we remember in particular, and we've sung already, we're remembering the life of Jesus Christ and his death and then new life, his resurrection. This is a traditional thing. Maybe some of you have done before, but then we say, he is risen. <laughs> Brett's already done this. So you're, you're well-practiced. So I'll say it again. He is risen. risen All right. It's true. It's true. And we say these things and some of that, I don't know how long that tradition has been going on. Maybe since he was risen, maybe the church did that right away, but it's true. He's risen indeed. And so in amongst life, like in amongst the pain of life, the joy of life, the urgency of life, the searching in life, the shortness of it, the things that we just even looked at and were reminded of life, in amongst that, we are offered, and hear this, we are offered true life. True life that is uh, not, and, 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 and you hear this all the time, that's not something maybe you haven't heard before, but this life is true life, and this life is different, and, and so different, and so much better that Christ can say, you may, you need to, in fact, lose your life to gain life. That's how different this true life is, that Christ, in fact, could say, lose your life to gain life. So just know we're not talking about the same life that often happens and that we speak of in our conversations day to day. There, there's no other offer for this true life except from one, Jesus Christ. There's no second options out there. This life comes from him and no other. He is called the resurrection and the life. That's his, that's his title. That's the character of who he is. It only comes from him. And so again, hear this. This morning, you cannot find true life from yourself. You cannot find true life anywhere except from God. You need to hear that. It's very rare in our, in our culture that you hear anything narrow like that. But it's true. It's not a work of man. This life we're talking about is not a work of man. It cannot be found by man. It cannot be orchestrated by man, manufactured by man, given by man. It is a work of God. We're going to see that in the passage, and this is our big idea uh, through the passage and for this sermon is true life is a work of God. It's not a work of man. The resurrection is a work of God, guaranteeing, we're going to look at three things this morning, and the first is this, it's guaranteeing a changed life. It's guaranteeing a changed life. Now, if you remember Good Friday, we looked at Exodus 12. If you weren't here, you can, we have those actually on the website. You can look at that sermon online and maybe catch up. 
But we looked at Israel in slavery needing to escape. They needed rescue. They were in bondage. They're in slavery hundreds of years. And we looked at the fact that true rescue came from God, comes from God, only comes from him. And it came through substitution. It was rescue by substitution. And it was rescue by removal. This was the work of God. Then we looked at the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And the blood of the Lamb, then we know in, in Exodus, it was spread over the doorposts of the homes of those people, and then God passed over those homes. And then he brought them out, and he brought them to himself. And we looked at, again, the blood of the Lamb, the same truth is true for us. True life is offered for us, not for another temporary kind of out of Egypt uh, desert experience, but like spiritual death. Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God. We looked at, he offers, he offers salvation. He offers true rescue by substitution and by removal. The resurrection is what proves he was a worthy sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God then, gave himself in our place as a substitute. Then he bore our sin on the cross. And he bore the weight of the sin. You need to hear that. He bore it completely on the cross. Your guilt and your shame paid for, dealt with, made right. And then he offers his righteousness, this spotless, perfect lamb. God in the flesh and the resurrection proved it was done. It was a worthy sacrifice once and for all. The resurrection proves it. And it proves that this change he offers is not temporary. It is eternal. And it is true life. God in the flesh doing this work. And and so in verse 17, even before this passage that we read just a little bit before in verse 17, Paul knows the way to this. He knows if Christ hasn't risen from the grave, then all of it's a lie. There is no true life. And just like go after it. Just I, go figure it out. Just live it up. Try to find it from somewhere else, whatever it is. And so he says, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then verse 32, he says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And rightly so. But if Christ is risen, then he offers you true life. He offers you and I hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the work of God guaranteeing life. And which is why it matters so much to Paul. He's writing to the Corinthian church. We have redemption church here this morning. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. Uh, They knew about communion. Remember Good Friday, we talked about communion, this reminder of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, this life he offers. They knew about communion. They had done that. They knew about the resurrection. It's not the first time that they had heard about that. But they stopped believing or they had forgotten that this was for them and that this gave true life that mattered day to day. This affected their life today. And when they left this afternoon and for the rest of their lives into eternity and the Corinthian church had forgotten that and they were living in a sense like the devil. And it's almost like Paul anticipates their skepticism as he talks about the resurrection. Look at verse 35. He says, but someone will ask. Someone's going to ask the question. Someone's doubting. Someone's like, yeah, but I don't know. That's just like a church thing. I said, I don't know. And he says, someone's going to ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And they're not asking like, like, how does it happen? They're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this like has anything to do with my life today. So like, does that even happen? How does it work? And look at what Paul says. He doesn't say, look, that's a stupid question. You ever heard like no stupid questions? This was a stupid question. But he doesn't say this is a stupid question. He says, verse 36, you foolish person. It's not even a foolish question. He says, you're a fool. You say you believe in the resurrection? You're doubting this, that this can even happen? This is a work of God, remember. True life is a work of God. 
And so he goes on to say, what you sow does not come to life. Again, verse 36, you can see it there. What, what you sow does not come to life. Listen, unless it dies. Verse 37, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed, its own body. So, so Paul says here, let me illustrate it for you. You foolish person. The resurrection is a work of God. And so here's your illustration. And I think I have a picture here. There you go. This is what he's doing. He's saying, look, look, think of like a seed. And then think of what comes from the seed. So he says like any type of seed, this would be a wheat seed. And that is like the head, the stalk of the wheat. That's not even the whole plant. That's not even the roots in the ground. How in the world does that happen? I could give you and I a series of seeds. Now I grew up as, you know, in a gardening family. My dad was very into gardening. So I, I know many seeds by looking at them. Oh, I know that will turn into this. But if I didn't know the seed, if I had no reference for the plant and you just gave me a seed, if I gave you a seed, any type of seed, you wouldn't be like, oh, I'll tell you what it's going to look like. That. Never. Well, how does that happen? What, what's Paul saying here? Well, look at verse 38 again. God gives it a body. It's a work of God. It's not a work of man. Verse 39 to 41, he's going to use now a second illustration. So he's talked about kind of gardening seeds. Now he's going to give a second illustration. And he's going to give a comparison of different types of creation. So, so listen, this is what he goes on to say, like, you foolish person, look, this is a work of God. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. So he's saying there's, a, there's differences even between the earthly things, earthly and earthly and earthly. There's these differences. And we notice, and this is where I think, you know, it's funny, right? Well, if you eat something and someone's like, what does it taste like? And it's meat, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure. What do we say? Right? It tastes like chicken. <laughs> But even there, you're like, there's something different and it's not the same. And we're trying to describe it. Well, he's saying, you see it. Even as you eat, like you see there's differences. Okay. And that's, that's what he's saying. There's a difference. Verse 40, there are, listen, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. Now he's saying there's differences between the earthly and the heavenly. There's, there's a different type of, of glory, of beauty even. So verse 41, he says, there is one glory of the sun and then, and then another glory of the moon. They're different. There's a full moon not too long ago. You look at that and it's like, well, that's not the sun, but man, that's, that's crazy. That's different. That's what he's saying. There's, there's another glory of the stars and stars differ from glory uh, in glory. So there's a difference between heavenly and heavenly. Has anyone seen the moon before? Has anyone not seen the moon? And that's a better question to ask. I think we've all seen the moon. If you haven't, you should go look for it. I don't know if it's still a full moon or not, but it's pretty awesome. Now, if you'd never seen the moon before, and tonight was your first night, can you imagine if the world had never seen the moon before? Freaking out. What is that? Especially if it's a full moon or a harvest moon, like, wow. But we see it and we just get, we get used to it. But Paul's saying like, there's, there's a different glory. There's like, there's something about this, like, wow. And that's different than what I see here. And that's what he's, he's trying to describe for us. And the resurrection, no one has seen it. No one has seen it except those that saw Christ. So we here, we haven't seen a resurrected body yet. And Paul's saying, you fool, it's a glory you don't know. You can't compare it. Like, how does that happen? This is a work of God. So you've got Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're all still waiting, in fact, for their resurrected bodies. They're still waiting like us. Jesus is the first. 
and he has his resurrected body, but we haven't seen it yet. We're still waiting for it. You know, and I, I, I think the temptation for us, I know it is for me, is we want glory now. We want a sense of that now. We want something eternally, like a change now. Our, our world is obsessed with it. We're obsessed with our hair, our hands, our feet, every part of our bodies. Comparing ourselves to others all around us. Our minds aren't sharp enough. Our clothes aren't trendy enough. I know mine aren't. The cars aren't fuel efficient enough or fast enough or powerful enough. Our homes aren't grand enough. These places we live in, the land's not big enough. With the resurrection in mind, this is a work of God. You are, you are not going to find the glory you're looking for in this life. And as Christians, even we have been gloriously changed on the inside, a new creation. But we need to remember this. We're not looking for glory here. We're looking for something that's a work of God and so much better. It's good for us to be reminded of this. Reminded of a daily, not just Easter this morning. So the resurrection is a work of God guaranteeing a changed life. Secondly, it's guaranteeing a better life. A better life. Again, Paul, Paul says, man, there's a crazy difference between a seed and a plant. And again, he's not saying this because he's just like, man, I love gardening. I just want to talk about gardening. He's giving us an illustration. He's saying there is a change. He's making this comparison. He says in verse 42, so it is, again, he says, with the resurrection of the dead. So hear that. That's the comparison he's making. Right? It is so much better. He gives us now a list. He gives us a list and, and these comparisons, and, and not just to show us that the resurrection is different. He's not, doing, he's not just saying it now that, hey, look how different it is. He's actually saying, look how much better it is. And it's important that we see that. Look at verse 42. What is sown, that is like, we die, we go into the ground, or yes, you can be cremated or whatever, but you turn to dust. What is sown is perishable. We all know perishable goods. I think some of us in 2020, maybe we're trying to only have per non-perishable goods in our home, right? Stockpile for a thousand years. We, so he's saying, no, it's perishable. It's going gonna, it's gonna to expire. It's just like, it doesn't last. What is raised though is imperishable. That is never to die again. There's no expiry date. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It's not a glorious thing to be thrown in the ground. You're not like, wow, that was really awesome. No, it's dishonorable. Can even being cremated, it's like, yeah, you can put an urn and write, it's just, it's not honorable, really. Saying it's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory, beauty. Verse 43, again, he goes on, it is sown in weakness. And we feel this, right? We feel, you get older, you feel the weakness coming on. Well, it's sown in weakness. Like ultimately death is as weak as you get. It's sown in that. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. So hear that completely strengthened, refurbished. That's how it's raised. It is sown a natural body that is just of the earth, fit for earth, you could say. And it is raised a spiritual body. So not an immaterial body, but spiritual Okay, so there's a difference. Jesus, when he rose, if you remember uh, Luke 24, told the disciples, they're like, whoa. Many of them didn't recognize him at first. When they figured it out, they're kind of freaking out. And he says, no, 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 like, like touch me. Right? That's what he says. He says, see my hands, see my feet. That is, I myself, touch me and see. See, a spirit does not have flesh and, and bones as you see that I have. So physical but spiritual now and fit for heaven. If there's a natural body, he goes on to say, there's also a spiritual body. So there you have it. He says, verse 42 to 44, perishable, dishonorable, weak, natural, speaking of death. And again, he's saying, but, but the resurrection is so much better. 
And our culture feels this. I feel this. Right? Our, our, our cult, a culture understands this. It's dishonorable. It's, it's fading away. It's perishable. Like, what do we do about life? And they're trying to find it. They're trying to find it in this life. Try to make life last longer. Trying to make um, even a funeral look, it's, it's a celebration of life now. And I'm not even saying like that's wrong to call it that. I'm just saying it's interesting that we don't like to talk about death. We don't like the word death. The world's like, well, let's just let's call it something else. Let's just get away from that. Just skip right to celebration of life. It's just interesting. We have uh, advancements in medical science. We love that. And did you hear they just found this? And they, they're able to do this now and they, this transplant or that or whatever. Guinness Book of World Records. I've always been intrigued at that. As a little kid, that was one of my Christmas gifts. I got a giant Guinness Book of World Records. I think it's from the early 1980s. It's probably worth some money now or something. And in there, I just, I was, I just love, uh, who's the fastest guy? Who's the strongest guy? And you just go through your list. Like, oh, that's so cool. That's so, what's the biggest, whatever. And you're going through this. You, but the Guinness book is what it is because we love like, oh, that guy tested the limits. You always hear that. Like, like no one's been able to do that. Or this record's unbeatable. It is beatable. There are limits. There are limits. Death is unavoidable. Spiritual death is inescapable. It doesn't matter how close you get to whatever we figure is extra human. It comes in the resurrection. And it's a work of God, not a work of man. This work of God guarantees a better life. Now, you have, maybe some of you watch extreme home makeover shows. I don't know. That's, if that's your thing, that's okay. <laughs> but in there, if you kind of understand what the, the show is about, you've got a home and it needs to be renoed. You got a budget, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, they had a home. Here's your home before. Here's your home now. Isn't that amazing? Just, wow, you did that? It's kind of cool. But here's the thing. They do that reno with all new things, all new parts and pieces from the outside. They might take an old piece of the floor and make a picture frame from it. And isn't that cool? They didn't take the old floor though with the old floor itself and just make it all new. What would be miraculous is if you took the home and said extreme home makeover and you didn't bring in anything and you just made it new with what you had. It's impossible, but that's extreme. And that's what, that's what the Lord's telling us. He said, this, this is extreme and it is impossible. Yes. So let's not dumb it down. This is a work of God. If you are in Christ, then Christ has something so much better for you and I. I ask you a question. Are you disappointed with your life? Are you disappointed? Maybe wishing for something better. You know, maybe it's a job. Maybe it's your physical strength. Maybe it's injuries. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll never get that back. Maybe it's something that's happened to someone in your family. <laughs> Missed opportunities. Uh, maybe you're spending your days chasing after health. And you're just like, I think there's something better. I think if I could just, if I just, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying don't look after yourself. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, but you know, in your heart, those times, I know in my heart, those times where it's like, wait a second, if I, this is the big thing right now. And if I keep going after this, I don't think it's actually going to be better. It's, it's not going to be the better that our Lord is telling us that the resurrection brings. He's got something so much better and it's not going to come in this life. It's not. And for us as believers, we need to remember this because we get so easily drawn in to our culture and the world and our flesh. And we're like, no, I think I can find it here. I'm just telling you, you need to hear this. You can't. This is a work of God. And, and this is not just at the end. This is like the resurrection. Yes. And new life to come. Yes. But this is now in prep for the resurrected life. What he offers you now, this relationship with him and satisfaction and joy in him cannot be found in this life. 
And he will wreck some of our lives in order to save us, to show us something so much better. And he will continue to bring suffering into my life so that I remember, no, 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 it's not, I'm not getting it here. I have something so much better. And what I have is not a work of me. It is a work of God, Jesus Christ, who rose from the grave. And so the resurrection is a work of God, guaranteeing a life that's changed, a life that's better. And then it begs the question, how? Like, like how? And it leads to our final point, And it's this, a represented life. That's how. A represented life. So now we're getting to this answer. How is this life possible? It involves a representative. So look at verse 45. So he says, look, it's going to be a change and it's going to be so much better. And here's why. Listen, thus it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. This is a quote from Genesis 2, verse 7. Adam was created. The first man, Adam, created. God breathed life into him. And now he should have passed on life, eternal life. They were with God, in the presence of God, in the garden. He should have, those generations on to now, we should have had life. But if you know the account, Adam and Eve sinned. Adam, being the head responsible, this federal head, he sins, and then death comes. And he said, so he's a created being, and now he's fallen. And Paul's telling us, like, he's, he's, he became a, light, a, a, um, he became a living being, created person, and we know that he fell, and then death came to all. Romans 5 says, verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, listen, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death came through one man, and then it's guaranteed. There's no one wondering here, unless you're totally ignorant. Maybe I won't die. Maybe I'm, no, it, it's so natural, no one's wondering. And this is what we're told here. So it's because of this first man. Now, Adam seems so distant to us. This first man, Adam, and you're like, oh, I know that. And that's that biblical character. Maybe you grew up in Sunday school and you heard that. Kind of seems like that got college friend. It's like, Adam, oh yeah, yeah, Adam. What's Adam up to? Where, where is he? Oh yeah, 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 him. That's kind of what it feels like, I think, at times. Like, where, where does he live? What's he up to? Well, this Adam in verse 45, whether you know him or not, this first Adam, affects your life at a more personal level than any other Adam you might know. He affects your life at a more personal level than any other Adam you'll ever know. Death spread through this guy. It's a guarantee for each one of us. And not just, you just die. It's, it's death because of judgment, because we were to be with God and we decide, no, 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 we know. We know what to do. God doesn't really, I think I, and because God is holy and just, he says, no, I, I will punish that and I must. And then the punishment being eternity in hell. This is because of this first Adam. So listen now, there is a second Adam. And he tells us this, and you can see it in the text. Verse 45 to 47, he's going to tell us now, but listen, there's a second Adam. You need to know the weight of the first though. It would take a work of God to get you out of the predicament you find yourself in, out of death. And he says, there's a second Adam. Listen, he says, verse 45, the first Adam became a living being. Again, he's created. He receives life. But listen, the last Adam. So there's the second Adam. This last Adam became a life-giving spirit. This Adam actually gives life. He's not created. He gives life. Verse 46, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. So the first Adam came first. He's, he is a created man. Christ, the spiritual, meaning fully God and fully man, he comes. He's this last Adam. So what he's telling us, verse 47, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. So he's fit only for earth. Right? This is, again, why we're not trying to get just back to the garden. 
ah, oh, so, so good to get back into the garden. No, no, no. We're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, something that's even better than Eden. And only God, by his good grace and love for us, would offer us something better than Eden. But he does. He says, this first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Again, eternally God, Jesus Christ. So the second Adam is way better. Way better. Now, you can read that and be like, well, that's cool. I'm glad he's better. Guinness Guinness records. Hey, this guy's first and this guy's not as good. This guy's better. And maybe you're into statistics. Maybe it's just like that. It's like, this this is kind of cool. Paul's not into stats. He's not telling you this to show you, you, you see, this guy's the best. You should get an autograph from him. So it, it's not so, it is what he did, but what he's showing us is this is to represent you if you will receive it in faith. This is not just like some stat, hey, this guy did this thing. Oh, that's cool. That's amazing even. Oh, that's so much better. No, no, no. This is a team that he's offering this for you. He's part of, in a sense, he's the leader of the team and you can be a part of that and represent it that those stats, those count for you and for I. That's what he's saying. So we, we hear this and we ought to be thinking like, yes, Lord Jesus, praise God for what you have done. Because I can't do that, but you're representing us. The first man represented us. You just said you're offering us this last Adam who's so much better and just as sure it's given to us. And so again, listen, the final two verses, he says in verse 48 to 49, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As is the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. There's two separate teams here, and you're, you're either a part of one or the other. And as is the man of heaven, listen, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall we also bear the image of the man of heaven. So you and I are represented by two atoms here, potentially in this room. There's only two that represent the human world. If you are represented by the man of the dust, the man of the dust sinned, the man of dust was separated from God, the man of dust died. And so will you. You will die in your sin. You will die separated from God forever. An eternity in hell. And that's not to say that to scare you. That is the word of God. That is reality for us as sinners against the holy God. And as is the man of dust, so you are guaranteed that that will be you. And if you are represented by the man of heaven, listen to this. The man of heaven was perfect. The man of heaven paid penalty for sin. Paid it. Completely. Sentenced to death and he died. Then he rose again. The man of heaven rose again. So in that he offers you that to represent you, that it would be as if you have always obeyed perfect his righteousness imputed to you, credited to you. And as if you had never sinned bearing the weight of sin, no forgiven, clean, pure, dealt with done. It is finished. And then he says, and you know how you can know that because I will rise again. And he did. And then you will rise also. And so this is the offer, but it is only for those who will receive it. You need to hear it. This is the word of God. And this is life right here for you. You will hear a thousand different things. And for us as believers, you believe this, we will be told still other things and dumb this down where we forget the meaning and the weight of it. Receive Christ Jesus as Lord. He is the resurrection and the life. He is a historical character who came. He is real. He is the God man. 
You either are represented by Adam in the flesh or Adam of heaven. Man, if you are represented by Adam of heaven, this is the work of God. None of us are leaving here bragging, being like, hey, look what I'm doing. I'm part of this church. I do this. No, no, no. Look what Christ did. The better Adam. The work of God is done. We have life. And so this is why we sing these songs. This is the work of God. John 1, 12 to 13 says, But to all, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, listen, but of God. It's a work of God. Came across a flyer not too long ago, and it was about barbecues. It's barbecue season. <laughs> this is, you think the world doesn't feel this? And, and I'm certain like all of us feel this. A barbecue, and listen to the, like the ad. <laughs> it was, uh, unleash your inner grill master. Buy this barbecue and this inner grill mass, whatever that is. Resur- it has, doesn't it have like resurrection language? Like the world feels it. And we laugh at that, but it's like, you know what? It would be nice to have something new. Hey, that maybe would really change mealtime. I'd be like a better person, better father. I, it's not offered by barbecues. And we can laugh at it, but I get sucked into that. It's resurrection language right there. And I want us to see that as a church, because we're like, no, no, that's laughable, because I know what it means to know the resurrection. Christ is in me, not this grill master. That guy needs to die anyhow. Christ is in me. He will raise me up at the last trumpet. Through his body and his shed blood and his conquering of the grave and rising again. Not a barbecue, not anything else in this life. The world longs for life. And I would say rightly so. Long for it. And we want it. And you should. And go after barbecues. If I had more money, if I just better grades, better body, better retirement, entertainment, pleasure, health, status, whatever it would be. And it's interesting because none of those things are really wrong in themselves. But that's the world's thing. And as believers, that can become my thing very quickly. But we have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who raised from the dead. We have a representative. And so again, to close, hear this again. You cannot find true life apart from God. You cannot. You cannot find true life partly from God. I'll take a little bit of him and a little bit of life. True life is a work of God and it comes completely from him. He doesn't share the throne. He doesn't say, Hey, you want some of this? You you can have some of that too, but no, no, no. It's, it's lose this life to gain life. It's such good news. It's a work of God. True life is that it comes through Jesus Christ crucified resurrected on the third day, the one who calls himself as we started. And I'd mentioned the resurrection and the life. So he is risen. risen He is risen. risen He is risen indeed. Amen. He is risen indeed. So the resurrection again, guaranteeing a changed life, a better life and a represented life. And so with that in mind, hopefully that's um, stirring your heart to worship in song right now. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and um, yeah, I want the team, you guys can want to head up right now, and uh, let's pray, and then uh, worship together in song. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we just prepare right now to lift our voices to you in worship and song, Lord, we pray thanking you, thanking you for the resurrection, thanking you for this better Adam, this representative Jesus Christ. 
Thank you, Lord, that we truly can be changed. Not in these weak ways that maybe we have tried or were tempted to try. Truly something better. Not small better, but Lord, something that is gloriously better. Even unthinkably better, Lord, eternal and lasting. And then, Lord, that we have this representative and we just, we praise you for that. Lord, I, I pray in the name of Jesus again. Lord, would this reality, this truth of what you have done, this work of God, settle on our hearts. Lord, not so that we'd leave here just with some feeling, but Lord, would you um, change us then? Lord, and for some of us here, I have no doubt, Lord, that uh, some here would not be represented by you, that they have not bent the knee, that they have not acknowledged you as Lord and creator and king. Lord, that they are still looking for life in different ways and just hoping it works out. But Father, in love, you have done this work and I pray that you would show them. Show them their sin. Lord, and death is the reality for them. But then show them what you offer in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray if they see that with faith, then Lord, they can't but repent. They can't but believe in you. Today is the day of salvation. And Father, for us, Lord, would we remember this and would it change us today, change how we think, how we live, what we go after in this life as a church? Father, would we be a, a church about resurrected life, Lord, this true life? So Lord, we lift our voices now to you in worship. You are worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen.